Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to talk with Will I Am, uh, seven-time Grammy Award winner, uh, musician, uh, superstar, as we know. But today we're talking about an insight, an idea of a different sort with Will. Good to see you, Will. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Good to be here. Will, you have started a foundation uh, years ago. You have focused on uh, education as it relates to young people. I want to ask you about the, the foundation and what else you're doing. But first, why is education so important to you? Well, I was born and raised in uh, East Los Angeles, um, a part of East Los Angeles called Boyle Heights. Um, and it's a pretty poor neighborhood, um, riddled with gangs and all the things that come with gang activity, drugs, drive-bys. A lot of my friends are dead and in prison, and some of them moved out and have families. But I was uh, rescued because I was a part of a magnet program. Ever since I was seven years old, I went to Brentwood Science Magnet, part of Rivera Junior High School in Pacific Palisades, and was blessed with uh, a great education. Um, and now, things are different than they were when I was seven years old to 18 going to school. You know, the world's changed and technology is getting smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. Um, and the reason why I want to focus on education um, in the ghetto that I come from, getting our kids, building robots, making apps, um, creating maps on Esri GIS maps, is because, you know, right adjacent to every ghetto, a couple of miles, away is a prison. And prison is big business. Um, it's private, and there is no private sec sector for education. It doesn't really exist. So you want to combat business with business. So you want to get these kids equipped and skilled around the biggest thing in the world right now, and that's technology, so they can you know, boycott those prisons by never going there, by putting their mind in things that, you know, allow people to connect and um, uh, live fruitful, full lives via the technology that they bring to market. Like imagine if WhatsApp came from Watts. What if Twitter came from Boyle Heights and stayed in Boyle Heights? Right, so that, that's the vision and the goal um, and what I try to encourage our kids to take an interest in. I, I want to get to the performance and what you've seen already and what you've achieved in a minute because the numbers are pretty extraordinary and I know the audience wants to know that. But first, let's zero in on some of the things you just said. You said robots. You said teaching these young people things that they didn't know before. Why did you choose robotics? Why did you choose those specific things for these kids? Do you think that's where the growth and jobs are of tomorrow? Why robotics? Um, so there's a movie called Waiting for Superman. Um, and it talks about the American education system. More importantly, Roosevelt was highlighted in that movie. And my mom went to Roosevelt. And, uh, and the reason why that movie hurt me is because the title was Waiting for Superman. It's not waiting for Congress. They're not waiting for, like, Obama. It said waiting for a Superman. And this guy is not a real guy. And they're waiting for a fictitious character to solve real problems. So, and then I went out and met people like Dean Kamen and Lorraine Jobs and Jack Dangerman, who are like superheroes to me. And Jack, and Dean Kamen has a program called First Robotics. And when I saw it, I'm like, wow, how come that can be in my neighborhood? How much does it cost for that program? So then I found out about how much it costs. So I used some of my money to bring robotics into my neighborhood. So it's not, when, when you say robotics, they're not building like humanoid robots. They're building like, you know, machines that can do autonomous tasks, and, um, and it's engineering, really, right? It's a, a cooler, tangible way of saying, you know, electrical <laughs> engineering and computer science. Um, same kind of, uh, you know, rovers that are on Mars are the kind of things that these guys are building and when, you're, when you're doing first robotics competitions. So now our kids compete every year uh, in St. Louis um, building robots. And, uh, there was one girl named Cynthia. She was like, you know, Willie, because I come from an all Mexican neighborhood. And she was like, you know, Willie, um, I was always ashamed of my father because he like would stand outside in the corners to get jobs to go out and fix people's houses. And I was always ashamed that he had screwdrivers and things like that, a building, because everyone else, my friends, their fathers had like regular jobs, you know, because you know, we're illegal. But now when we, I built my robot, for the competition, my dad helped me build my robot. 
my, my, he helped me build it, and I appreciated that my dad could make things with his hands. And he was so, he was more skilled than the, 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 um, the robotics mentor that we had brought to help the kids build the robot to compete. So it really put, you know, father, teacher, you know, child, and created this, this triangle of, uh, you know, participation and encouragement and appreciation. Um, and it really changed the grade point average and the kids' attendance in, in the after school program. And, and through your fame and popularity, you've been able to connect the dots because the children of yesterday didn't grow up saying, I want to be an engineer. They grew up saying, I want to be a musician. I want to be a fireman. I want to be something that perhaps may not have yielded the success from things like robotics. Yeah, so if you take like technology as a whole, if you take hardware, software, operating systems, telcos, and you couple them all up, that's like a multi-trillion dollar industry. It's like super big. It's the biggest thing on the planet. And you would think it being so big that kids will wake up every morning and say, man, I'm trying to be like Michael Dell. I'm trying to get my Michael Dell on. <laughs> and Michael Dell is awesome. Like, think about that. Bill Gates is awesome. Steve Jobs is like awesome, awesome. So why isn't that? It's not the first thing on their minds. And I think, you know, as a, as a, as a culture, media, um, music, um, popular culture, we need to start celebrating today's rock stars, right? The Beatles, to me, is Facebook. Rolling Stones is Google. There's new rock and roll stars in, the, in, in popular culture, and we need to start, you know, aiming our youth to dream down that avenue. When, when did it click for you? I mean, you talked a minute ago about growing up and seeing some of the kids around you going to jail, doing, doing the wrong things. What was it that triggered something inside of you that said, that's wrong and I want to go this way? Mm. So uh, my best friend, his name is Apple, um, and he's from the Philippines, and he came to America in 1989. And he was adopted by a guy by the name of Joe Ben Hudgens, and the program was called Pearl S. Buck Foundation. And Apple came from the Philippines, didn't know any English. And he came to my ghetto and was like, I want to live here. I was like, you want to live here? <laughs> and he was like, no, I do. He was like, the way he could communicate, he was like, I come from a village called Pampanga, Angeles City, and I pump water out the ground. We wash our clothes on rocks in the river. To me, this is paradise. I was like, no, this is not paradise here. <laughs> so that friendship, that's a guy I started Black Eyed Peas with. That friendship of like two odd couples, there was a TV show called A Perfect Strangers with Cousin Larry and Belky. And I was like Cousin Larry, he was Belky. And uh, <laughs> that friendship, you know, just opened my mind up to like, one day I want to go to the Philippines because my best friend's from the Philippines. And I stopped hanging out with the kids in the neighborhood. It was like Apple changed my life because I was hanging out on the streets. One day, um, you know, a, a friend of mine came and said, um, I don't want to say his name, but uh, got shot in the face. He's dead. I remember that like if it was yesterday. A walk by, not a drive by, they walked. Right? And they were, we were teenagers. Like, wow. And, but Apple changed my life, that guy changed my life and we started something called the Black Eyed Peas and it took us around the world. And that's the reason why philanthropy is a part of our DNA. Because if I didn't meet Apple, philanthropy is what brought us together. Joe Ben Hudgens changed our lives by, you know those programs on TV? Just five cents a day. Apple's one of those kids. Yeah. Mr. Hudgens gave Apple five cents a day and then adopted him and brought him to America. And the first after he got off the airplane, he came to my house. And my uncle was homeless, and he hung out with Mr. Hudgens at a bar and was sleeping on his couch. And like, what is, Mr. Hudgens is an awesome guy. To let my uncle sleep on his couch, and my mom babysat Apple, and we, we started a group. So philanthropy is something that I'm obligated to do. And so is Apple. That guy is like an awesome dude. So somebody helped you and now you're helping so many others. Everybody just needs an opportunity to get a shot to actually move the needle in their own life. Tell us about when you first started the group and how tough it was. You knew you had real talent, so you started this group. 
Black Eyed Peas. Yeah, so there was a teacher by the name of Miss Montez, and she uh, used to encourage me to, you know, dance and perform in uh, recess or in lunch in her classroom. And when you have encouragement from your teachers, the Mr. Wright, William, that was great. You know, that goes a long way. And um, when the gang members in the neighborhood were like, hey, Willie, rap, booms. That kind of stuff changed my life because they could have said, hey, Willie, hold these drugs, Holmes. They could have said, hey, Willie, hold this gun, Holmes. They were like, hey, Willie, rap. The encouragement, like you gotta encourage kids. Um, it goes a long way. So when we started Black Eyed Peas, we knew that we had something because the people that surrounded us, you know, they, they gave us a nudge of do it for us. And um, we had a bond of, um, a band of, you know, misfits that played music, the instruments, were poets. Um, and if I had to do it all over again, if, we, if I was 15 right now, 2015, it wouldn't just be musicians and poets. It would be coders. It would be developers. Right? And that's why I'm really encouraging these kids. Not like if when they say, I want to do music. No, you don't. You want to do, you want to create music platforms. You can always do music. But you can create your own instruments nowadays. Right? Nowadays, there's, there's, it's not even the sky's the limit. Saying the sky's the limit is limiting. <laughs> Right, there's, it's there's infinite. space, yeah. yeah. Well, well, when was it that you figured out, okay, I've got this talent, I'm popular, and I could actually use this to help a lot of people on the issues that really matter. When you were going along in your career and you started to see your music really resonating with people. Um, one day, uh, we were in Africa, and I was really excited to go in to Africa to perform. We were on stage and I looked out in the audience and I'm like, where are the Africans? Because <laughs> we, were, we were in Cape Town. I'm like, where's everybody at? I really thought I was going to see like... Where were they from? <laughs> no, it was just, they were Africans in Cape Town. I was like, where are all the black people at? And so then they said, uh, your ticket price is high. Most of the people that you thought were going to show up couldn't afford your ticket. Oh. So then uh, we did interview on TV. And, and in my heart, I knew if I were to ask management to come back and do a free concert, we would never do that. So I went on TV and said, we're going to come back to Africa, do a free concert so people could come see us. And by doing that, forced the issue for us to return back to Africa and do a free concert. And then we had people from Soweto and everyone come to our show. And then my birthday hit, um, uh, 2005, uh, my birthday. They said, what do you want to do for your birthday? Let's party. I was like, nah, I want to go to uh, Bandeyache. So I went and did tsunami relief on my birthday. All right? And I noticed that all the time the natural disaster happens, they call musicians to raise awareness. And I realized that there's a natural disaster that happens all the time in the hood. Right? It's a tsunami of neglect. It's an earthquake of no opportunity. And so I wanted to use the platform to address things that are happening in my own neighborhood that shake it every day. Um, you know, because they, we all, they call us to sell products. They call us to raise money and raise issues. And then we ignore the day-to-day -day ones. You know, no education, lack of opportunity. Um, no encouragement. Females are really not a part of the conversation when it comes to tech. Little to no tech, female tech entrepreneurs. So hanging out with Marissa today from Yahoo, that she's like a superwoman to me. She's like an awesome force. And more, more females, I wish one day she could mentor Cynthia, because that girl, Cynthia, is a promising little superstar in my after school program. So you're teaching kids code, you're teaching kids robotics. What kind of uh, performance have you seen? These numbers are extraordinary in terms of what you've seen in a short period of time, Well, So I don't, re I don't mean disrespect by mimicking the accent. It's just that when I was little, I talked like that. And my accent has changed because of where I traveled. But like where I'm from, you know, 
there was one little girl, she was like, you know, Willie, like, <laughs> Willie, you know, I never really thought like going to school really meant anything because like there's people in the neighborhood that are already, they're making money. I was like, but you don't want to make quick money. Quick money means you're going to, th the results are not good. Trust me, just take your time. Right? I know the peer pressure is hard. So these kids were like failing beyond failing, like 1.2s um, and, and lower, like Fs, 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 Fs. Attendance like a week out of the year. They would ditch like crazy. So these kids, I started with 60, now have 300 and a waiting list. They went from having 1.2s, now they have 3.4s and 4.0s. Some of our kids are going to go to MIT and UC Irvine. Where else? And, 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 and we work with good, good folks. It's not just me. It's a, it's a cocktail. So it's college track. Lorraine Jobs, thank you so much for, um, you know, opening, opening up the, your whole program to come to uh, Southern California because initially they were just in the valley. And I saw her program. I was like, I need college track in my neighborhood. But more importantly, I don't want to just send kids from the hood to college, and when they graduate, they just have debt. That's the worst thing to do. So can you be open to coupling your college track with a robotics program? So I want to take college track and couple it with FIRST Robotics. And then I met Jack Dangerman, who has GIS maps, and I asked him if I could use his maps for my classroom. So Jack said, what would your kids possibly do with my maps? I'm B2B. You know, we don't even have a consumer-facing product. These are serious tools. I was like, look at my kids as sensors. I can't ask your maps how many drive-bys happened in the past four months or how many helicopter chasings or pursuits happen. Look at our kids as sensors to provide more information and data for your maps. Teach them how to build maps. So we did that in my after-school program and it started off as a case study and this year at the White House, Jack Dagerman pledged $1 billion in uh, GIS uh, maps for K through 12 uh, kids across America, but that that program is what was the case study for that. So they build maps, they they write uh, apps. Uh, one of our partners wanted to do hackathon. I was like, no, you can't use the word hackathon. <laughs> and they were like, why? I was like, no, you can't use hackathon to kids who would uh, otherwise be in gangs. You don't use the word hack. You use apathons or opportunity building. Let's get rid of the hacking word. If, if you're a bank, you don't want to have a freaking hackathon. I don't want my money in your bank using <laughs> hackathons. So our kids build apps. They write maps. They build robots. Every year they go to China for a student exchange program with State Department. And all these programs cost money. And when I don't raise money, I've got to fork it out, which I don't mind doing because the results are awesome. And um, you know, I'm really proud of people like Cynthia disciplining themselves and, you know, fighting through the peer pressure because it could be kind of geeky in the hood if you're, you know, building robots and stuff. But this is still in that ghetto. I mean, this is still in your neighborhood. How do you make this bigger? Um, scaling it, um, partnering up with folks that have deeper pockets. But I got tight jeans. My pockets ain't that deep. <laughs> And you've, you've, you're using a lot of money in those pockets already. Yeah. So have you been able to raise awareness, raise funds from the elite group that's here in Davos this week? Yes and no. Because uh, there's a lot of, uh, it's my first time here. And I would rather meet folks that have programs that I could bring to my neighborhood than have to peddle cash from people. I don't feel comfortable like, hey, help me out with what I'm doing. I like to see folks, um, what I've been doing up here was like, wow, that's a nice program, can I bring that to my school? And then figure out how to fund it. But I just don't feel comfortable like uh, going around asking people for money. I didn't, I didn't get here doing that. So if, if people see what we're doing and want to help out, that's great. But if you have programs that our kids could benefit from, that's even greater. If you could help us scale it and take it from Boyle Heights to other cities like Fifth Ward, Mississippi, more importantly, Papanga. Apple, why can't, why does it just have to stay in America? It could go to the Philippines too. So, but what we're doing there is something that could be, you know, adopted and ported out to other cities. We know the metrics, we know how much it costs for each one of those programs. Um, and FIRST Robotics is an amazing program. So is College Track. So this isn't my stuff. But the idea is a couple 
is, you know, project-based learning, right? Because what I noticed is, you know, if you ask, I have an a, um, a 11-year-old niece, like, hey, Miranda, what do you do for fourth period? Do you guys like code now? <laughs> so you guys aren't coding in fourth period? I remember when fourth period, I took wood class. I don't know what that wood class skill gave me. <laughs> what did you do in wood class? I used to make medallions and stuff. OK. But I'm just saying, like, you would think, as big as technology is, every fourth period, kids are coding. It's not, I don't get it. I don't make any sense to me at all that kids aren't taking iOS, Microsoft, Android, mandatory. I don't, I don't get it. You would think that's what it would be. So education reform should be on everyone's you know, to-do list, no matter what country you're from. And it's a cycle, because if you, you, if you have a shot to do well and learn this kind of stuff at a young age, then it happens in the next school, and the next school, and the college, and the next school. Well, you know, so Dean came, and one day I was in London, and he calls me up, and he says, well, I am. You need to get here right now. I'm at the Royal Academy of Engineering. I got everybody here with Nobel Prize winners. If you know Dean Kamen, that's how he's a real excited guy. You need well, to come he's, here. He's developed a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, you need to come here right now. So I went there, and then they said, um, you know, I, I was to speak before Dean, and so they announced me, and everyone started chuckling. Ha, 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 ha. And I was like, wow, I'm embarrassed. I don't even know what to say. People were chuckling, like, what is he doing here? And so I said, you know, it's funny that I'm here, but what's funny is that my industry doesn't have a shortage of singers. And if I was playing football, there's no shortage of football players. If I was an actor and actress, there's no shortage of actors and actresses. There's no shortage of baseball players and foot, uh, basketball players. In every single junior high school and high school, there's a football field, a basketball court, and a baseball field. And only three companies benefit from that kind of skill set. That's NBA, NFL, FIFA, right? Those kind of things. Right? There is a shortage of engineers, and it's not my fault, and that's not funny, but it is kind of funny, because if I was to show up at an NFL event, there wouldn't be chuckles. I'm here to help. Anything I can do to encourage kids to become engineers so some engineer doesn't make an engineering app to where we never need an engineer again, that's the thing that we need to worry about, is when the engineer, the lack of it, becomes an application, right? Um, because People creating awesome things like Zaha Hadid is an amazing woman, and uh, the building that she, the buildings that she make, her and her team, uh, are amazing. And I would hate to see a day where that is just an application. All right, and it may sound funny, but that's not far out. That you know, advanced you know architecture is just going to be some application, or you do it on your laptop, or your tablet, or your watch. If you would have told me, if I would have told Quincy Jones in 1989, I'm going to make music on a tablet and share it out to 100 million people at once, he'd be like, get out of here. This is impossible. Now you make music on a tablet. Because, and, and the same thing could happen to engineering. So you want to encourage kids to you know, be electrical engineers and scientists and technicians. And I'm saying that as a musician. You know, and, and doing all I can to do to uh, to change that in, in in popular culture. So, if you were starting out right now, would you start and learn code and go a different route than music? The question is, am I learning code right now? And you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in my in my company, I am plus. There's like, um, I adopted a company out of Bangalore, India, and. Um, a lot of the folks that I work with are teaching me how to, to code. And um, folks at MIT gave me, uh, um, they accepted me to be an MIT uh, student. Well, I don't have time to go, but. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you can teach. But I, I, I really want to, you know, I want to put my work in. Because I, I, I think it's a, a great place to create. Where do the teachers and sort of the leaders at the foundation come from? How did you get the talent to actually teach these students code and, and robotics and such? Okay, so when you, um, for families out there, I encourage you to get your kid um, into FIRST Robotics. And if you don't have FIRST Robotics uh, around your neighborhood, apply for one. Um, and w with FIRST Robotics comes mentors. Um, so we, 
we have the, the benefit of, of being mentored by folks from NASA, Leland Melvin and a bunch of folks come and mentor our kids. And it's a it's an awesome program. So the program itself provides the uh, tutorial and encouragement with mentors and stuff like that. Um, and then we have people like Enrique Legaspi and the, the local folks that um, we teach the teachers as well. Um, what, what's been the hardest thing in terms of breaking through a certain mentality uh, in these tough neighborhoods, getting to a child, getting to a young person to make them believe that in fact it doesn't have to be this way? There's always like a couple of kids that are open-minded and you have to be very um, strategic is a bad word for what you have to be strategic on the first ones you adopt so they could go out and spread the word. But if we could start at nine years old, the reason why I say nine years old, because gangs are starting at 10 years old. Like you, you, you got to know your competition. <laughs> and the, comp, the people that are competing for, for your kids, gangs are really sophisticated. And so you got to compete with those, that, that mentality. So you want to get the kids at nine years old, even younger. So at first robotics, like there's nine-year-olds building robots out of Legos. It's an awesome program, first. And it's so awesome. Yeah, you could do your own thing, but why, why waste all that time when you can adopt and apply and couple things that probably were never intended on being coupled together? Um, so as we start as early as uh, 13, um, and with more capital and, and support, we could go as young as eight. Because what's happening in, in inner cities is, uh, it's sad, the things that are happening. And then there's the I Am College track. Talk yeah. to us about that, how kids move through the foundation as they get older to learn more and more. Uh, yeah, so college track is, um, Lorraine Job started college track. And um, it's a great program to get kids on track to go to college. Um, and so you, they get their grades up. Um, it's um, a lot of tutoring and mentoring, um, socializing and communicating with them in a, friend, in a friendly kind of way where you know that the person there is not just there for because they're getting paid. So the mentors and the, uh, the teachers that we have at the after school program at College Track is an amazing uh, thing. But I was concerned if the only thing they were doing is going to college. And if there wasn't any skill set where they can become entrepreneurs uh, and create jobs on their own, right? That's the worst, that's the last thing I want to do, is to get a kid to go to college and then they just have debt. Right? They're better off not going to college if that was the case. So we have a great cocktail to where they go to college, they apply themselves, and the result is a skill set to where they, there's a job waiting for them right away. Or they have the ability to create their own jobs and have a career. Where does the I am come from? I am Will, I am college. How'd you come up with that? Oh, uh, just my name is William. <laughs> <laughs> That's it? I swear to God, it's it. Is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I just, it just, um, it became a way for me to not have to worry about naming something and just say, I am scholarship, um, or I am scholars. Then I had a, I, I launched a program on Oprah called I Am Home, where one day I got a DJ gig, I paid a lot of money, and I was up there DJing, like, wow, I'm playing other people's music, <laughs> and they just paid me a shitload of money. <laughs> and so I told my, my folks, I'm like, hey, do you guys mind, like, you know, not commissioning this money so I could give it away on Oprah to kids who go to school. And so Oprah let me um, start my scholarship program by giving away my DJ money. And then the next year we did a, the same thing again. So I gave the money away and started a mortgage program. And we called it I Am Home, where we would, you know, buy out um, people from uh, losing their home by taking over their, um, their foreclosure. Um, and paying off their 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 um, their bills so they could keep their their home. Like it was sad that they were losing their home because they couldn't pay, you know, twenty thousand dollars 
because they lost their job. So I'm like, I asked my mom, hey, Ma, do you mind if I do this? Is everybody okay in the family? Willie, everybody's okay. I don't mind if that's what you want to do with your money. It's your money. <laughs> so I did that, did that home, the, more, the I am home. And then from there, I just wanted to continue to do more and utilize my money. And Ron Conway, Mark Benioff let me go to their homes and, and talk about what we were doing to, to sustain the activities that I started myself. And Mark, Mark has been a, a champion and helped me do those kind of things. And, and what has been the biggest change in the music business that you've seen as you have uh, risen? Oh, so 2005, there was a... Uh, so 2004, when we released Where's the Love, there was Tower Records, Sam Goody, there was uh, Warehouse, there was uh, all those HMVs. And then 2005 came around and uh, HMV, uh, Sam Goody and Warehouse closed. And then uh, 2008, Tower Records closed. And then 2010, Virgin Megastore closed. And everything was on iTunes. And what that means is, our industry used to sell hardware, right? RCA started this whole thing called the record industry by um, when RCA purchased Victor's talking machine. Um, RCA was also radio. RCA is NTSC, technology for, for visuals on TVs, and, or PAL if you're in Europe. RCA was an awesome company. And we were software, which is music, and hardware, which is the appliance that you hear it on. But then we, they stopped caring about the hardware when the CD was introduced by Philips. And the amount of money the record industry was making, hand over, over and over again with CDs, because everybody had to then rebuy all the stuff they had on vinyl and CD, to, where, to the point where they stifled anything to, that came after the CD. Like the mini disc stored more information, but for some reason it didn't take off. Um, and then file sharing happened. And the music industry, instead of creating a platform that was about data, right? so here we are with Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp. Nobody had to pay anything for it. But for some reason, them motherfuckers are worth a lot of money. Yeah. Part of my language, and I'm sorry for cursing, but from the music industry, a lot of people feel that way. How can something be worth billions of dollars and nobody ever exchanged a dollar? When our industry is always about selling, selling, selling. When, in theory, now that you look back, what we should have done was create a platform that was about sharing and listening and owning the platform, the data. So our industry was ran by folks that didn't see tomorrow. And now our music, our software, is selling other people's hardware. I have a new song on iTunes, go download it for 99 cents. But the artist doesn't really get that much money in that 99 cents. So I got a feeling it's still one of the number one downloaded songs on iTunes. So MasterCard, um, Visa, and American Express take their percentage. Apple takes their 30. The record industry takes their percentage, and we get our percent from their percent. What does Will I Am get? We get a percent from their percent. <laughs> and when you add it, it's like pennies. It's pennies to every download. And then there's Beats. So in Beats, we got smart and realized that we should be in the hardware business. And so, and it shows you that when you couple content and hardware, um, software and hardware, you do amazing things and you're really selling something. And so music, if you're just making music, you're not selling anything. You're just allowing other people to sell things around your music. And then you're waiting for a licensing deal where your music is licensed to sell somebody else's product. Or publishing is uh, is always king, um, so publishing will, will, you know, doesn't hasn't really, you know, fallen fallen apart. So that's the re one of the reasons why we at I Plus are making smart fashion product, because the intersection of fashion and technology, we haven't seen that yet, and it's coming around the corner really fast. Is that like the watch you have on? Yeah, so we created this device here. I founded and funded the company back three years ago, and we create um, fashion um, technology. And we base it off of Chanel cuff, or a Fendi bangle, or a Gucci bracelet. And we make phone calls without the use of a phone, SMSs, full emails, and responding 
composing. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, music, uh, quantifying yourself. From all the phones you have now, that are all the watches that people are coming out with now, require a phone for them to be functional. So we were like, we don't sell phones. So why am I going to tell you to, you know, buy my device to talk to a phone? I just want people to be able to be out there, look fresh, and connect. Which so. brings you right back to coding, robotics, and education. Will I am Thank you. musician, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. <laughs>